On this episode of China Unscripted, it's getting riskier than ever to invest in China. Some companies are trying to move manufacturing out, but is it too little too late? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Matt Ganesta. I'm Shelley Zhang. And Chris is unfortunately not here today, but he will be back next week. He's totally not trying to deal with something he accidentally unleashed from the pocket dimension. Absolutely not. All right. And joining us today is Harry Moser. He's the founder and president of the Reshoring Initiative, and they aim to bring manufacturing jobs from overseas back to the United States. Thanks for joining us, Harry. Great to be here. Wonderful to be here with you, Matt. So, you know, these days, China does more than a quarter of the world's manufacturing um, in a big jump since, you know, they entered the WTO 20 plus years ago. Now, as a result, people all over the world can buy stuff at really cheap prices. Uh, is there some sort of a horrible downside to this? Yeah. U U.S. manufacturing has declined as Chinese manufacturing grew. So, Back, back after World War II, U.S. produced about 50% of all worldwide manufacturing, and we've gradually declined. And specifically, we've had a trade deficit that's grown from uh, zero in uh, 1979 to $1.2 trillion last year. And about, about a third, 30 40% of that deficit is in goods and things is due to our trade deficit with China. And so the, the U.S. has lost about 2 million manufacturing jobs to China out of about 6 million total manufacturing jobs that we would have if we had balanced trade instead of this huge trade deficit. So, so we're a much weaker economy because of the trade deficit in general and China in particular. Well, I feel like, you know, when I learned this in school about U.S. manufacturing, it was kind of like, okay, it's okay. We're now a service economy. Right. Yeah. And and the, the, the amount of, of other uh, non-farm jobs, you know, mostly service stuff is, has gone up tremendously since uh, we've lost this manufacturing. So like, what's the problem? Aren't these better jobs? They aren't better jobs. The, the manufacturing jobs pay better than service jobs. Uh, people... Uh, people that come out of high school go into apprenticeships and become a toolmaker, a welder, a precision machinist, on average, make as much or more than university graduates, especially liberal arts university graduates. The, uh, the loss of those jobs uh, makes the and, the and the companies, you know, there were tens of thousands of companies that disappeared along with this is a, a huge drain in tax revenue to the federal government. It's a uh, it, it minimizes or weakens our uh, industri industrial manufacturing capability, so defense capability. So, so right now, uh, you, you've probably seen the the studies, the uh, uh, the special uh, committee, I guess it is, select committee in in Congress did, did a simulation of what would happen if we had a war with uh, over Taiwan. And in two weeks, we ran out of munitions, missiles, rockets, you know, howitzer shells, everything. And especially now that we're supporting the Ukraine, we're supporting Israel and, try, and trying to be prepared for Taiwan. If that happens, we don't have anywhere near the industrial capability. We, we don't make enough steel. We don't make enough, don't have enough machine tools, don't have anywhere near the capability to do what we did in World War II when we were the arsenal of democracy and were able to make the difference by what we were able to provide in, in that war effort. So, so if, if we're a service economy, you know, good luck uh, reciting poems and uh, to to the invading army <laughs> if you can't make the munitions and the tanks and the you know and, and the, everything else you need. So, so you, you need you need a significantly strong manufacturing base to survive as a nation, and we're at the board, we're at the edge of not having that. I mean, so, so you bring up a really good point about, you know, it weakens our national defense to not have this capability. But I also like what you said about, you know, these are actually higher paid jobs often than service and they don't require a liberal arts degree, which means the next generation doesn't have to go to college. They can go to trade school um, and they can get paid more. Can they, though? Uh, unless <laughs> if manufacturing moves back to the United States, I think is the point, right? I did a study a couple of years ago and I, I took the average, the, the lifetime income of an English major, you know, by age, and then the, uh, and, and 
and then the income of a toolmaker, an apprentice toolmaker. Of course, the apprentice toolmaker starts at 18 and is making an income while the uh, English major is spending you know, $30,000, $40,000 a year on getting the degree. I, I took the difference in income. Toolmaker always made more. Took the difference in income, paid half of it in income tax and invested the other half at 7%. And at the age of 49, the toolmaker had a million dollars more net worth than the English major. Wow. So, Shelly, you're an English major. I am an English major. Total waste. You should have become a tool maker. That's what my parents always said. (laughs) They definitely didn't want me to become a certified public accountant instead. (laughs) Well, at least you also have an economics degree. So there's something. Uh, my, My son is a professor of Portuguese and Brazilian studies. So he did not listen to me. <laughs> ah, well, there you go. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about the challenges of getting manufacturing uh, back to the U.S. But like, why is it so cheap to make stuff in China compared to the U.S.? I mean, the obvious one is that people are paid less there. But there's got to be more to that. But that's the overwhelming reason. And it's the, the, the wages in China now in manufacturing average about $7 an hour. And the U.S. in manufacturing, $21, $23 an hour or something like that. So, so it's, it's a third of what it is here. That, that, that's, that's, the, that's how China was able to start out being so low cost because even you know, 20 years ago when they really got going, it wasn't $7 an hour, it was 50 cents an hour. Okay? So they started out with really low wages, were able to attract tons of work. They therefore dramatically increased their output They bought new machine tools, robots, built new factories. Right now, if you go there and you look at Chinese factories compared to U.S. factories, the Chinese factories are much newer, typically more automated than ours. So you've got low-wage people, hardworking low-wage people who really appreciate their jobs, Uh, in many cases, better trained people than ours because they have training programs, et cetera. And and so you've got all, all that. And therefore, the combination allows them to produce the product for about 70% of the cost of making something in the U.S. And that, that's a huge difference. The, uh, and, and it's not just the assembly plant. You know, if you look at the assembly plant, like say where the, say the car is assembled, the, the, the amount of labor content there is, is not huge as a percentage of the total cost. But there's the, there's the labor content in making the axles and making the gears and making the tires and making the glass and everything else and all this stuff that comes together and brings with it a lower cost. And therefore, when you put all that together, the Chinese cost on average is 70% of the U.S. cost. And, and that's enough to attract companies to go there to, to get those lower, take advantage of those lower costs. So what, what we do to overcome that, we offer the the TCO estimator, total cost of ownership estimator, which helps the company not just look at the price, that, that, that FOB price or XWorks price, but add in the duty and the freight and the carrying cost of inventory and the, the risk of stocking out and the uh, intellectual property risk, all, all these kinds of things. And, and when they do that, they find a very different picture. In fact, so if you look at that, the horizontal axis, the axis across the bottom, is China price as a percentage of U.S. The blue line is the X Works or FOB price, and you can see the peak of it is around 70 percent. So about like I said, we did this for the first 190 cases of users using our TCO estimator to do this calculation to decide should they source in China, should they source in the U.S. But when when the calculation uh, calculates the total cost, all these other factors included, it shifts to the red line. And if there happens to be a, a 15% Trump tariff, Section 301 tariff, it shifts to the yellow line. And the key th- and you can see how it moves to the right. The U.S. becomes more competitive by that method of measurement. The key thing is to look at the numbers in the lower right-hand corner. So you can see the uh, based on price, the U.S. wins 8% of the time based on total cost, 32%. And if there's a 15% tariff, then 46%. So just by getting the companies to do the math correctly, dramatic amounts of work can come back to the U.S. without increasing inflation, without you know making it impossible for people to afford refrigerators and stoves and cars and things like that. So how have the companies you've talked to reacted to seeing your TCO 
they they have had a culture for the last you know forty years of buying on the lowest possible price. They're they've been uh, they have something called purchase price variance. So the purchasing people are measured each year on what they pay for a, a, a basket of goods. You know, if I'm doing it, I'm responsible for you know, these hundred parts. I know what they cost me last year. I know what they cost me in aggregate, and my job is to is to reduce that, or at least not not let it rise. So their bonuses, their rewards, their promotion is based on cutting the price, and therefore they it's hard to convince them. So I've had uh, I've talked to salesmen at let's say job shops, machine shops, things like that, and they're selling to a big company, and and I say how you doing? Well, it's tough. I I go in to see the purchasing guy. And and he tells me I've got to match the Chinese price. And I, I can't do that. And I say, well, well, well Bill, I, I, I've heard about warranty issues. I've heard about not product not coming in. I've heard about too much inventory. And the purchasing person says, that's not in my budget. That's somebody else's budget. <laughs> He's got to worry about that. My job is to buy the stuff at the lowest possible price. And so, so uh, for, for 30, 40 years, companies have done that. And and now they're learning that that isn't the right solution anymore. So this is a, a slide that was done by the company called Resilink. They're experts on on supply chain, and and they said and the, the lady, the owner, the founder, very smart lady, she uh, presented this, and she said that the world has gone from the left hand part of that image to the right hand. And so in the left hand, it says companies are doing their best to save pennies on the components that they're buying. And now instead, they're making sure they have the components so they can assemble their product and ship the product and make tens of thousands of dollars of margin by shipping the product, whether it's a car or you know, refrigerator, you know, whatever it is. And, and so, and, and so that, that mindset has changed. And as, as the mindset changes, then it becomes easier to convince them to do what we want them to do. So the other thing that, that's made a big difference recently, and I think it relates very much to your theme, uh, the number one, uh, based on survey, a survey by uh, Chief Executive Magazine, the number one uh, factor driving reshoring today is the fear of, of geopolitical decoupling. It is the fear of geopolitical risk, the, the fear that uh, you know what, what companies have seen happen in Russia, Ukraine, which cut us off from all kinds of products from over there. They've seen the Middle East, and they're worried about Taiwan, China, and and so spe- specifically, um, and, and, and big, most important is China, because because we import so much from China, and in, and in so many categories, we're, uh, we're dependent on them, and there are not other, not other good alternatives, certainly not in the U.S., but even not in the rest of the, of the developed world to replace the source from China. So, so the companies are, are, are very concerned about that. It's driving them to, to bring the work back because of the existential risk that if they lose, if they can't get all those components, all those things they need, then they just will not be able to make their product and, and ship it. And so we came out with this map and it shows the probability of decoupling, the probability of being cut off completely from that other country or in some cases regions like, like uh, South America or Africa. So the probability of being cut off each year. So in the U.S., we say, in Canada, it's essentially zero. You know, it's not going to happen. In Russia, it's a hundred percent. We're not supposed to be buying anything from Russia right now. And in China, we, we tried to be as sort of reasonable as we could, but based on a survey of of geopoliticians, we set it at three point five percent. So the probability of of decoupling with China, we say, is three point five percent per year. And the idea is for the companies to then look at the uh, the products that they're selling. And, and how long they'll not be able to sell if they get cut off from China, for example, and and how much margin they'll lose for those months or years that they're cut off. And they compare that to how much more they're going to have to pay for the products in the U.S. instead of continuing to get them from China as a form of insurance to, 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 to be willing to spend, just like companies pay for fire insurance and flood insurance, be willing to pay for decoupling insurance so as to make sure you've got the products and if something goes horribly wrong, you'll stay in business. Do you see companies taking that seriously now? Oh, yes. Yeah. So as I said, the, the number one criterion 
the number one driving factor for reshoring right now is geopolitical risk. Is I've got a dozen quotes I could have put up, but I didn't pull them of of all kinds of top Wall Street figures saying that uh, every company is now planning for the possibility of a catastrophe in the in over Taiwan. That uh, that companies are seeing it as a form of insurance that they're. Uh, getting out, out of China you know, and getting to a safer place. And it isn't always going to be the U.S. Some cases it's going to be Mexico, Canada, could be Germany, could be, uh, uh, you know, other, other, could be India. India is rather, rather popular. We do something informally sort of called the Cracker Barrel Index, right? So like uh, I remember in 2017, I was in a Cracker Barrel and I was looking at, you know, in the shop, right? And they've got all these like, you know, American flag hats and t-shirts, everything was made in China. I mean, it was like probably 90 plus percent was made in China. Uh, this year went into a Cracker Barrel, looked at stuff. It was less than half was made in China. Uh, a lot of the other stuff that it wasn't US, it was like Vietnam was huge. And there were, you know, Malaysia for, for some of the, um, the clothing. Uh, and it was a lot more scattered, but like I wasn't seeing as much US stuff as I would hope for, you know, a American flag T-shirt. But there's no question, and part of it's because the the company who's the retailer who's making that decision looks looks at the price and not at the total cost, you know, and and that's part of it. And there's still no question, but that the U.S. the price, you know, manufacturing cost, exports price is higher, and 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 therefore. Therefore, the question should be, what can the U.S. do do about that so that when you go in there, you'll find a higher percentage of U.S. product? And the our, our advocacy with the government is the first thing is skilled workforce, that we should uh, redirect a lot of our resources from uh, training uh, or from educating you know, sociologists, anthropologists, et cetera, many of whom go on to work at Starbucks, uh, and instead to uh, support, subsidize, incentivize uh, apprenticeship programs like in Germany, where six, 60% of the kids go into these apprentice programs and come out with wonderful skills that help them improve their productivity. So we need more of these people with that kind of training, both, both so we can increase our output. You need more people to increase output. And we want to increase output by 40%, so huge, so five, 5 million, 6 million people, and then to increase productivity. Better, smarter, better trained people can run more productively the most modern equipment and get the best out of it. So number one is skilled workforce. Everybody should agree on that. And then second, number two, is to reduce the value of the dollar by about 20%. Most economists agree the dollar is overvalued by 20 to 30%, mainly due to the fact that we have the reserve currency. So uh, Companies, countries, et cetera, store their money here because we're the safe haven. And when they do that, it, they buy dollars. It drives up the value of the dollar, makes us, the U.S., a great place to be a bank, but not such a good place to have a factory. And we want it to be a great place to have a factory. So combination of having enough people, better trained, get the dollar down so that price difference, instead of being 30 or 40 percent, comes down to 10 or 15 percent. And then it'll be easy to convince the companies to produce more here, source more here. And then when you go to that store, you'll see more more made in USA product. Isn't it kind of a, oh, I mean, I have two questions. First about the skilled labor. Isn't it kind of a chicken or an egg situation? Because if you don't, you don't have the jobs for people to graduate from trade school and to have these like high skilled manufacturing jobs because they are currently in China, uh, and like, is there going to be like, it feels like you can't have investment in only skilled workforce if there's no jobs for them when they come out. Well, there, there, are, there uh, is, there are lots of jobs. The, I haven't looked at the most recent uh, job openings report. I think it's the JOLTS report that the government puts out. But the last time I looked, there were something like 500,000 open uh, manufacturing jobs. So come Companies looking to hire people with specific manufacturing skills. Some, some are high skill, tool maker, welder, precision machinists, and others are are low skill because there's always going to be some low skilled people in a company. But the uh, there's no question that the jobs are there. 
one of the reasons it's been hard to recruit in the past has been offshoring. Because if you imagine you're in a small town and, and you're looking around, you're gra- getting ready to graduate from high school, you're, looking, you're thinking about what to do. And, you're, and a couple of years ago, your uncle lost his job at the mill, at the factory, and, and he's working at Walmart or something as a greeter because and, and, and there's no more manufacturing jobs. You say, why would I want to go into manufacturing if there's not going to be any jobs here for me after I get trained? Which is sort of what you're asking. And we say that by, by promoting reshoring, by letting people, letting the guidance counselor know how well manufacturing is doing, that work's coming back, no longer going offshore, it'll be easier for the guidance counselor to say, yes, yeah, Susie, if you want to become a welder, become a welder. That's a great career. Once again, we see that it's coming back. How long would you estimate that process of reshoring is going to take? Because when you talked about the reason that these factories are in China, like not just the skilled labor, but also the machines, the automation, those things. Um, I remember reading about entire industries in the U.S. that it is very hard to get back because, you know, they sold all their machines back in the 90s when they offshored. Well, we don't want those old machines from the 90s. We want new machines because you need new machines to be productive and and competitive, especially if you have high wage rates. But so this gives you a perspective of what has happened, which is, you know, the history is always a good preamble for the future. And so you can see that when we when I founded the Reshoring Initiative in 2010, in that year, we announced about we we identified about six thousand jobs being announced. A combination of reshoring by U.S. companies, think General Motors, Ford, GE, or FDI, foreign direct investment, so Siemens, Toyota, foreign headquartered companies bringing jobs to the U.S. So the combination of the two, about six thousand jobs. The trend did very nicely. Went up, peaked in 2017 with the Trump tax and regulatory cuts. Fell off with the trade wars. And then picked up very nicely under COVID as companies saw that they could not depend on getting product from offshore the way they had been depending. And so we, uh, and then it, it, last year it hit a peak of uh, 350,000 jobs being announced coming back, significantly enhanced by the CHIPS Act and the IRA. So uh, the chip factories and the EV battery factories, plus other miscellaneous products that were included has been a significant portion of the last two years of of rise there. So so right now it looks to us like you know three hundred thousand a year or so is is a, is, a, is a good number. We can't do much more than that because at the moment we don't have the people, we don't have the factories. Uh, but you can get factories. You can build a decent factory in a year or two. You can get all kinds of machine tools and other kinds of capital equipment in a, in in a year typically. Uh, the, the problem is the people. The biggest problem is is convincing the uh, these the high schools to go from um, from from measuring their success based on the percentage of their kids that go on to university to rather rather measuring their success on the lifetime income and the lifetime job satisfaction of the people that they graduate and they and they don't do that and but but they're starting to. We see manufacturing programs starting up at high schools and community colleges around the country and and specifically the government um, to, to enable these chip and EV battery factories has been subsidizing the local community colleges, universities, high schools to develop training programs to, to, to provide the workers needed for these new facilities. So there's there's lots of lots of positive sign that it's happening, but it, it it's taken us, like when I first started working, uh, when I was in high school, and this was back in the fifties, so long, long time ago. Okay, uh, I worked for Singer Sewing Machine, you know, the, the big uh, machine, uh, sewing machine company at their main factory, and 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 the, the engineers there laughed at the Japanese products that were coming in because they were so simple and so primitive. And eventually, Japan took over the, the industry, and. And so it's taken from say 19, from the 50s and the 60s till now, so 60 years for the U.S. to lose its place, for the U.S. manufacturing to decline, and it's going to take certainly 20 or 30 years to rebuild. It's not a, it's not going to happen this year. It's not going to completely happen this decade. But it, I, I'd be delighted if if I could be sure that it would happen in the next 15 years. I, I'd, I'd be delighted. I mean, one of the things that I 
you know, you, you talk about all these jobs coming back. Um, I remember during COVID, like one of the things that I thought was going to happen immediately is manufacturing coming back, but it didn't seem to to do it at the pace that I thought it was. And your data is showing that there's, you know, 300,000 new jobs announced, but like, aren't other jobs also leaving at the same time and going to, you know, like Vietnam, Malaysia, et cetera, India? Not so much. Uh, let me see if I included this. If you, if you look at the trend in U.S. Uh, manufacturing employment, data put out by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we, we've had, had this steady decline that it started 30 years ago, roughly, 40 years ago, and coming down like this. And then starting in uh, 2010, it's gone up gradually like this. Almost every year, a, a slight increase. And so it's gone up by a million or, or, or a million and a half since that in that time, it com completely up. You know, we've gone from this to, to that. Okay. And, and the reason for that significant increase is that the, um, is that in the, those earlier years, in that previous 10, 10 years, we were offshoring. Work was flowing out of the U.S. to China, flowing out to all, all kinds of countries around the world, but especially China. And, and now for the last 10, 12, 13 years, that rate of offshoring has declined dramatically and the rate of, of uh, reshoring and FDI has, has gone from almost nothing, like the 6,000 a year up to the 300,000 or so a year. So, for example, if I had the chart, it shows that if we had continued on this downward trend uh, to today, we would today have 6 million fewer manufacturing jobs than we actually do. So there's been a dramatic reversal in the trend. The, so I, I'm, you know, I'm delighted. An another another chart that I have uh, shows the the mix of goods consumption and services consumption in the U.S. And what, I think one of you mentioned that we're a service economy, not a not a manufacturing economy. And and the, the chart, this the other chart shows that the that that balance, you know, we had these these two trends: service going up and manu and goods going down. And now the again the last twelve years. The two are stable, so the, the the goods consumption as a percentage of, of uh, consumer purchases ha has stabilized for the last thirteen years. And and as I achieve my objectives, and and U.S. manufacturing goes up by forty percent, that that difference between the services and goods will will shrink, and 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 people will no longer say this is a service economy. They'll say this is a service and manufacturing economy, which is a much sta more stable condition for the for the country. Are there specific industries? Because we've been talking about manufacturing kind of in general. Are there specific industries that you see driving this trend of reshoring more than others? Okay, um, th there's sort of two time periods for that. Uh, uh, for the first ten years that we tracked, uh, it was clearly transportation equipment, which is primarily cars was by far the biggest driver. It's a huge industry, and, and the foreign companies especially were putting all kinds of factories into the southeast in Texas uh, to, uh, to increase their, their share of the U.S. market, Toyota, all these companies. And so, so that, that, was, that was clearly the strongest part of, of this. Now, the last two years with the IRA and the CHIPS Act, with the government pumping hundreds of billions of dollars into into uh, reshoring, you know, to bring these these new industries, these industries back to the U.S. Now that the the about fifty five zero percent of the jobs announced in the last two years have been either chips or EV batteries. Wow. Okay. So the the U.S. government is pumping, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars into this, which is essentially you know our money, right? So isn't there like i mean is it worth it how how would you factor that in yeah we, we the us had fallen dramatically behind on chips and we used to be the leader by far 20 30 years ago and and now we we allowed it to decline it had declined because because we're not competitive as i've said um and, and ev batteries china dominates a, a year or so ago china was making 95% of the of the ev batteries in the world they were really good at it we 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 hardly were doing it. Tesla was getting started. And so I think it had to be done for these two very important sectors. Um, the, the My concern, though, is that uh, specifically with the chips, I, I testified at a, at a Senate 
uh, uh, committee hearing about a year and a half ago on this subject on China, U.S. supply chain, you know, security, all this kind of thing. And the and what I told them was that I was concerned. First, I supported the chips thing, but that I, my concern was that the um, that we, uh, the U.S. and and all the other major countries are building new chip factories. So it's not just here. It's it's Taiwan, it's South Korea, it's Japan, England, Ger- Germany, everybody's doing it. And so the capacity to produce chips is going to rise dramatically. And I, I believe that the demand for chips will not rise proportionally. And so there's going to be an excess capacity of chips. And it's, it's generally agreed that the U.S. manufacturing cost on the chips, given today's dollar, et cetera, will be 10, 20% higher than in most of those other countries. So, and, and we don't assemble enough electronic products here. Think about the electronic things you buy, the cell phones, the servers, TVs, the electronic medical devices. They're almost all made in China or somewhere close to China. And so we're going to be faced, we're going to have all these new chip foundries with excess capacity. The, the market price is going, to, is, is going to stay low for the chips. And they're going to have to convince China to buy our chips to make these electronic products to sell. Oh, back I don't us. think we can even sell those chips to China, right? That's part of the Chips Act that, like, these are high tech chips that have military, you know. A lot of them aren't high tech. A lot of them are just regular, regular kind of chips. The, not, for the foundries that are being built in the U.S. But not they're not all the way, high tech. They're not all high tech. Yeah, because the way that the Biden administration has been essentially advertising the Chips Act is about the civilian military use about how this is like like high tech you know the u.s is continuing its like cutting edge leadership in chips and things like that yeah. but but th- th- there isn't there's not vaguely enough military demand to support all the capacity that they're going to produce they're going to have there's not, not vaguely enough and and therefore most of the chips that are going to come out of these foundries are going to have to go into uh, consumer products and industrial products and uh and, and and we don't produce a lot of those. Almost you know, the chips eventually go into a, a circ- printed circuit board, which goes into an electronic assembly of some kind. And the making of the circuit board and the electronic assembly is typically done in China, Taiwan, you know, Vietnam, somewhere over there, and especially China. And uh, and so we we advocated with the government that that if you're going to spend these hundreds of billions on the chip foundries, that we should be making the U.S. overall price and cost competitive. We should be having a tide that raises all boats so that the assembly of the products that will use the chips also occurs here because otherwise many of those chip factories are going to go bankrupt because they won't have enough business at a low price level. So so the, we need to ha- we need to be making more stuff that uses chips. And I guess the secret would be making more uh, smart products. You know, like smart uh, sofas and smart uh, refrigerators. refrigerators, smart, you know, cooking pots, smart. I mean, any anything really could be smart. Um, smart wall paintings. Actually, they do have those. Except for screens. possibly this idea. Oh, yeah. This is definitely a dumb idea. But the but your point about actually the, the stuff that we do need. I mean, the medical equipment that you mentioned, like, like our medical equipment is made in China. Like that seems like like a really big risk. Like if we can't get, you know, cars from China, not a big deal for a year. If we can't get medical equipment, like people will die. No question. I mean, if you can't get pharmaceuticals from China, uh, mo- most of the, m- many of the pharmaceuticals and most of the precursors, the the active ingredients that go into the pharmaceuticals come out of China. And, 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 and so the part of the, part of the government effort is to subsidize the pharmaceutical industry to produce more here, so we are more self-sufficient. So I agree entirely. But if you look up, if you look up medical devices and go look at the imports, or you look at the ones that you you buy, uh, you know the breathing machines and all this kind of stuff co- coming out of China. The one thing that doesn't come out of China and that is made here is the implant. So the hips and the knees and the shoulders and things like that are, are very very consistently made here in the United States. There's a heavy industry around uh, Warsaw, Indiana, where two or three of the companies have huge factories that are producing a lot of those uh, those implants. I don't I don't want a Chinese implant. <laughs> uh, I mean, okay, so uh, there's this trend of U.S. companies starting to move out of China, 
right? But there, it started five, yeah. six, seven years ago, actually. But go ahead. Sure. But like, like, let's look at Apple for example. Um, Apple, w w when when I bought my new iPhone this year, I was like, can I find uh, an iPhone that was that's not made in China? Because I had heard that you know they're setting up in in India and Brazil manufacturing. And could I could I get one of those at least? But it was not even available here. Uh, Apple's still doing a tremendous amount of manufacturing in China, and even though they're they're adding some factories in other places, like they're still in China, right? It's not like a huge, quick move. Yeah, I was listening actually to CNBC this morning, and uh, they had an expert on who was discussing uh, Apple in China. <laughs> you know exactly what you're talking about, and, and he said yes. Uh, I think he said that uh, twenty percent of Apple's sales are in China, and ninety percent of its production is in China. No, Apple doesn't do the production. Foxconn, Jabil, you know, all these other companies do do the actual production for them, but ninety percent of it's in China. So they're moving as fast as they realistically can to shift that production to, especially to India. So they've had a, a major effort to, to get into India, but I, I read a I read a study by. McKinsey, I think, that said that it would take, the McKinsey study, I think, said it would take eight years to get 10% of the production out of China into India, <laughs> you know, because it isn't just the assembly, it's you have to get the components, the, the, the semiconductors and the diodes and the, you know, the, you know all the electronic devices and, the, and the, everything else that goes into the phone should be produced locally too, because you don't want to be shipping that from all over, especially not from China or or if something goes on with China, you're still out of business. So, so I think they overstated the time, but not, unquestionably, it's a long time to get things done. But to, to, if, if we can agree that it's essential that we not be dependent upon China as soon as possible, then when's the best time to really get going? Now, <laughs> you know, if you say if you say it's a big problem, let's not even try it. Well, then we'll have a big problem still ten years from now. If you say it's a big problem, let's get going. Well, then the problem will decrease over time. Well, so so for an iPhone that costs a thousand dollars and is made in China, if we were to make that not in India but make it in the U.S., how much would that iPhone cost? Uh, it, if you if they made, I've seen different studies on it, but if they if you look just at the assembly cost here. You know, the final assembly of putting the thing together and you assume the components are still coming in at, at roughly the same cost as what they would have been in China, then it's eleven hundred dollars, twelve hundred dollars. It's not much. It's it, 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 they, they then the question is, can you get those components here or can you get the components from other friendly countries that you can depend on when you need them? But the now I, I did a study on uh, to broaden the, broaden that topic a little bit to to inflation in general, you know, people say, "Oh, we can't afford to make the things here. We can't afford to get out of China because the cost of living will go up." And and it, it turns out that goods are still, uh, you know, not a huge part of our uh, consumption, and we already make half roughly of the goods that we consume here. And so, if you to, to get uh, say two million jobs back into the U.S., uh, you'd have to raise. Uh, you, you you would have a one-time uh, inflationary price increase of about one or two percent, and to get millions of manufacturing jobs back into the U.S. So not not one percent extra going on forever, but a one-time price go up by one one or two percent, and then and then then you go back to the trend that you would have been on in the first place. So so to me, it's the value of that to have that security to have that support of our industrial base the the, the stronger economy budget all those things is well worth a, a one percent or two percent price increase now when uh u.s companies are pulling out of china and it's not really a pullout it's like a gradually move out uh, in many cases right like with apple right like just a little bit of their production move out but like what kind of pressure are these companies facing from, say, the Chinese Communist Party or, or um, related pressures? Yeah, the, 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 I'm sure it depends on how, how big the companies are. Uh, you know, Apple seems to be doing okay, but Steve, Steve uh, has been 
famous for having a good maintaining a good relationship with China while he did whatever he had to do. And uh, and so many, many companies can't be as nimble as, as Apple is. Um, the, the, it, at China, it's difficult to get the money out. Like like if, if you've been earning billion, billions of dollars over there and you want to pull that money out, it, it, they make it extremely difficult to do so. Uh, if you if you're over the if smaller companies that are over there often don't have their own factories. They 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 have very very competent subcontracting companies in in China that do the molding, the assembly, you know, do whatever for them and, and then ship product to the US. And and when you try and pull that work out, they keep your tooling, they keep your technology, they start competing with you, making your product and selling it against you around the world. And and, and in some cases the when when it's been rumored that the factory would close, the the workers uh, uh, kidnap the managers, the, the U.S. managers, and lock them in their office until they until they get paid their severance pay or whatever. So to, to, between the society and the and the and the government, they can be pretty pretty aggressive. So it's so it's not easy. I and mean, there's 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 specialists who all they do is advise companies on how to work their way through that labyrinth so as to be able to get out as as uh, successfully as they can. So it's not an easy, the whole whole project's tough, but that doesn't mean uh, don't do it. It means get started and do it smart. I mean, it almost feels like, you know, when you have to, you know, leave a bad situation or something like that, you just do it as quietly as possible, right? I mean, it's not like the companies are necessarily releasing press releases saying hey we're we're leaving china right, right. yeah they're, they're not doing that at all hey, i know we're going to run out of time pretty soon now, you ever heard of ray dalio yes okay yeah. so he, he he's the founder of the uh, of bridgewater associates he's very very successful guy he, uh, i i did a, a presentation for uh, notre dame to their business school and i de- described ray as very successful very smart his net worth is more than Notre Dame's endowment. <laughs> wow, and and he's he's been very very pro working with the Chinese Communist Party over the years. But but let me tell you what I was going to tell you. He, uh, he he's done this study called the uh, Changing World Order, and he's looked at history and seen that there's been a series of empires. We'll call them. Uh, you had the Dutch, and then you had the British who took over from the Dutch, and the U.S. took over from the British around the World Wars. And, and now you've got the U.S. in decline, uh, manufacturing, trade, uh, uh, innovation, you know, internal turmoil, all kinds of reasons in, in decline. And, and you've got China coming up like this, like, like a shark coming up out of the water. He, he has a, um, uh, a list of 19 what he calls determinants that determine whether a, whether a country or empire is rising, it's sort of peaking out or it's declining. And if you look at most of those, the U.S. is in some state of decline and China's doing this. And the uh, and so you know, I, I've taken his data, I've analyzed it, and, and my, my conclusion is that that by enabling reshoring, you know, by getting more productive, by improving our trade balance, which having more manufacturing jobs that will improve income equality, uh, you'll have less turmoil in the country because the economy will be better. People will feel they're, they're, they're getting along better. Um, that that the U.S. can maintain its position and stability up here and not be in this feeling of malaise and, and decline. And that by, by stabilizing up here, that it'll give China time to decline because China is faced with debt. It's got severe problems with debt. It's got uh, demographic problems. Their their population has peaked. They're declining. They're they're, they're projecting a thirty million uh, shortage of manufacturing workers. I think by either twenty twenty five or twenty thirty, uh, they have drought issues. They got a, a series of, of significant issues that they've done. They've, they've done an amazing job of, of improving their economy. So I'm, you know, they've done great, but they're, they're starting to run into significant problems. And if we can stabilize up here. That'll give them time to flatten out up here, hopefully a little below us. And and and, and by the U.S. feeling uh, once again uh, that we're solid, that we're not in decline, that I believe that the U.S. and China can work out their issues. Whereas if the U.S. feels that it's that it's a weakening power and then it sees China continuing to come up like this, 
that you have a risk of what's called the Thucydides trap, which is the declining, the, 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 the dominant power, but in decline, eventually has a war with this upcoming aggressive, younger sort of sort of power. And I don't, I don't want to war. And so I believe that by making the U.S., by, by a, an aggressive job of reshoring, plus some other things, I'm sure, that the U.S. will be able to maintain its stable position up here and, and we can work things out with China. So I think we're less likely to have war if if we strengthen uh, our, our economy, especially by manufacturing. So it seems like um, having the U.S. government be supporting reshoring would be an important part of the effort to bring it back since they'd have to, for example, subsidize um, like industries like the chips industry and things like that. Um, how much support are you seeing from the U.S. government? Are there other things that you uh, want them to do? Well, we don't think they should subsidize. I mean, in these two instances, I said, okay, yeah, but I mean, they're subsidizing way too much. I mean, the, the, the subsidies for the cars, the EV cars turn out to be $10,000 per car, including the new car subsidy and the, and the resale subsidy comes out to $10,000, which is about a third of the cost of manufacturing a car. And you shouldn't have to subsidize somebody that much to get him to do something here locally where it makes sense to do it anyway. So, so I think that they're overdoing the subsidies, especially in that case. But they, in general, they should be getting away from subsidies because most people agree that when the government, everything the government has tried to subsidize, in, like Solendra, you remember in the past, every, the industries, the companies they've tried to subsidize almost always go bankrupt <laughs> because they're not good at picking winners. And therefore, we say that instead of picking industries, which is what they're doing now, that they should pick industry. They should make manufacturing more competitive, more price competitive. And if they do that, if you can get this 30% price difference down to a 10 or 15% price difference, for example, v- via a, a lower U.S. dollar, then, then the marketplace will make the decision. The marketplace will decide what industries, what companies, what products will be made here. And it will be a substantially greater number than than what we produce today. Sure. I mean, I would imagine arguing for a weaker U.S. dollar is not super popular right. with the U.S. government. I, I mean, I'm not even sure that can happen because, I mean, firstly, most people want a stronger dollar. Uh, but also, like, if the dollar weakens and then that boosts U.S. manufacturing, there's then there's more demand for U.S. goods, that strengthens the dollar again. Right? No, it doesn't have to strengthen the U.S. dollar again. No, the if you when when you lower the dollar, uh, it'll be more competitive to make things here. Things will be made here, and uh, you know the prices will go up a little bit. You know, one percent once, two percent once. You know, something like that, but not 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 dramatically. And so uh, people people have been told. It, it, that they want a strong dollar, but they, they don't have any reason to want to. I mean, if you travel abroad, you want the dollar to be strong. If, if you want to buy imports, you want the dollar to be strong. But but we don't want people to buy so many imports. We want them to buy things here. So we'll have a stronger economy to support the defense industry, to support the budget, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Well, well short of uh, adjusting the relative value of the dollar, uh, what can the U.S. government do to support industry, as you put it? Like, what are the things that are going to have a, a positive impact on reducing costs for industry overall? Well, the fir- first thing I suggested at the beginning was skilled workforce. That we should, we should. Uh, if I were the czar, I would, I would probably close a, thir- a quarter of the universities and uh, you know ha- have have more engineering programs because we need more engineers, more scientists, et cetera, more mathematicians. But we. But there's a. It turns out that 30 or 40 percent, thir- about 30 percent of university graduates between the age of say 22 and 65, at any point in time, are in a job that does not require a university degree. They're working for Starbucks. They're doing something or other. And and at the same time, we have shortages of welders, tool makers, precision machinists, etc. So I would shift those resources from uh, university loans many of which never get paid off, like a, like a trillion dollars worth eventually that, that won't, probably won't get paid off. I, I'd shift that instead to a, a apprentice programs 
to subsidize the apprentice program so more of the kids will decide that that's the right choice for them and and then we'll have the workforce that we need. So if you compare U.S. to Germany, in Germany, the wage rates are about the same as ours, and yet Germany has a trade surplus of about 5% of its GDP, and the U.S. has a trade deficit of about 3% of our GDP And, and what's the, in terms of goods. And the reason for that is that the Germans get really smart kids. They train them really well. They uh, therefore are more productive in the use of the equipment. They buy newer equipment for them. And, and, and they have really good engineers, lots of really good engineers that design better products and, and they succeed. And, and the world wants to buy a German product more than it wants to buy a U.S. product because the Germans do a better job of it. I want us to be more like Germany in that sense. So it's, so it's, it's possible, e- even with the current currency, even with our, our, our high wage rates, which, which are judged you know, when you compare them by the currency, the uh, to, to be successful, but it's but it's a really hard slog if you do it just with skilled workforce. You, you really getting getting the dollar down is the is the quick way to to make a difference. Yeah, I mean, I would I would suggest that one of the big things of of lowering manufacturing costs would be reducing energy costs. Uh, yeah, but if you if 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 our energy costs come down, if the price of oil comes down. Then the price of since oil is a fungible commodity and it's traded all over the world, and the price of energy is going to come down everywhere. If if anything, you want the price of energy to go up, at least for oil, because oil fuels the the uh, container ships that move the stuff here from there. And so, if anything, you would like the price of oil to go up, which would increase the cost of freight, and the price of natural gas to come down, because the natural gas is the precursor or raw material. Uh, from which uh, polyethylene and polypropylene are made, which are then used to make resin, which is used to make plastic, and therefore our our cost of making plastic goods would come down dramatically. So, so if if you want to play the energy game, I would do that. It turns out that sure. What about nuclear power? I, I'm 100 percent for nuclear power, thermonuclear power. T- turns out, j- just for reference, that that the cost of energy as energy, so as heat, as electricity, et cetera. Uh, is is about two percent of manufacturing costs. So even if even if you gave people electricity for free, uh, it, it would reduce U.S. manufacturing costs by maybe two percent. So it'd be helpful, but but not enough. Uh, but but I'm entire. I've been in favor of nuclear forever, and 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 the country is just barely now starting. You know, there's just some very good news that's come out about thermonuclear. That that that's starting to starting to make sense. And there's uh, several, uh, three, three, four, five groups that are making, uh, starting to make these uh, small micro nuclear reactors, the kind of things you could put on a truck and deliver somewhere, and it would be sufficient for a small city or a small town or something like that, and and get in place in three months instead of five years and not go over budget. So nuclear is wonderful. So uh, I guess the last question I want to ask you is for the people listening to this podcast. Is there anything they can do to encourage reshoring? Yeah. Uh, to, to make it happen, uh, first, when they go into a retail store, and if, and if you want to buy something and you can't find anything made in the United States, go up to the service desk and say, hey, I'd like to buy one of those made in the United States. And if they, if they hear that enough from people, then the store will eventually start to source made in USA products. If, if you work for a f- manufacturing company, do your best to enable productivity. Do you know high quality, high productivity, quick delivery. If, if the more competitive you can make your employer, the more work your employer will get competing with with the uh, offshore. Uh, you know, uh, support politicians that that want to do something about the problem, as opposed to just you know talking about the problem. All right, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Harry Moser from Reshoring Initiative, and uh, really appreciate you uh, being on our podcast. Yeah, how about uh, let me get in the uh, URL? So we're at reshorenow.org. Okay, and 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 for those of you who are interested, if if you have a case of reshoring that we haven't heard about, I'd love to hear about it. We if you tell us about a case we don't know about, you get a free manufacturing is cool T-shirt which is made in the U.S. out of U.S. cotton. 
And so if you, we'd love to have you report your cases of reshoring. And if your company has the opportunity to reshore, if they're thinking about reshoring, or if they're competing, trying to get work from someone else who could reshore, then you contact me and ask for help. We'd love to help you achieve that. All right, great. Thanks so much for joining us, Harry. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that I've been afraid of about you know companies pulling manufacturing out of China is that this was going to be just a short-term kind of trend, you know, ex- because of COVID and all of the you know delays from uh, all of the issues with shipping and supply chains and things like that. But as you know, that goes into the rearview mirror people would forget and it would seem like, oh, it's such a hassle to move out of China. And, you know, then it would kind of stop. Right. And and I think that one thing that I'd actually like to thank Xi Jinping for uh, is helping companies realize the risks of staying in China. By like capture, uh, by kidnapping their executives. Yeah. And, like- and just the exit bans and just, you know, like, you know, sending in like agents to like confiscate their books. Like it's crazy what's happening to some companies and like, you know, even if it never happened to my company, I would look at it and be like, is like, that's just a scary, incalculable risk, right? It's not a new risk though. I mean, remember what happened with the guy from Rio Tinto back right. in- That was like 10 plus years ago from it was an Australian company. He was uh, put in prison for like leaking state secrets, even though the, the, state, the state secrets was just company data that they later like retroactively called state secrets and then they they locked him up for that so uh, obviously china has retro- retroactive laws which is not something we have in uh, uh most liberal democracies but i think the point i'm trying to make here is that after talking to harry i feel like a little bit more encouraged because i feel like if he's seeing this trend predates covid by five or six years right. uh then you know, COVID obviously exacerbated it, but uh, there's a hope that it won't just fade away as people's memories of like COVID fade away because nobody wants to remember how terrible it was. Right. Yeah. And actually, I'll, I'll give a story because uh, one of the sponsors for for China Uncensored is Mova Globes, and they make the we have a couple of the globes behind us. Um, and Mova was telling me a story about how they left China, and it was a little bit before COVID, mm-hmm. and they said that. Like basically what was happening is that their um, production in China was getting like all sorts of government scrutiny. And in their case, because they were making maps, it was like, they're like, it was insane, but these inspectors would come and they'd try to make sure that our maps were in line with China's worldview. Like they had to have the nine dash line and they had to show the India border, like such and such. And Mova was like, we're not trying to make educational maps. Like- these, these are just like, like they decorative make decorative objects, decorative, decorative maps. Right. And like some of them are like historical maps and like, but like Hey, the, did your map from 1648 show the nine dash line? Yeah. I mean, and, and that was the kind of scrutiny they were facing and they're just like, I am fed up with this. And they pulled everything out of China, but you know, kind of like what Harry was saying, like they faced a consequence of that, which is basically that the Chinese government came in and they confiscated everything. They confiscated the factories and like their supplies that were still there, like the paper and the, and the you know, electronics that they used for the globe. Like it was like really like a huge um, setback for them to do it. And so I can just imagine like how much this is happening to, to like any smaller company, right? That, that wants to do it. Um, but the fact, you know, that they are doing it in the, you know, at all, right. I think that is encouraging. Why possibly the risk of staying is worse than the risk of going. Yeah. It's like that song, you know, should I stay or should I go now? If I, if I stay, there will be trouble. If I go, there will be double, but actually in this case, this should go. (laughs) I, (laughs) <laughs> the funny thing is, as soon as you started to make this analogy, I saw that it was going to be backwards. <laughs> yes. However, I, I had a larger point, which is that at the end of every podcast, we have to go off the rails. And so I was just helping facilitate that process. Oh, I see. So we're we're going off the rails now. <laughs> we're going off the rails and it's probably time to wrap it up. All right. Well, thank you for watching China Unscripted. I'm Matt Ganesda. I'm Shelley Zhang. Talk to you next time.
Miss you, Chris. 